Welcome to Gospel Tangents, the best source for Mormon history, science, and theology. I'm Rick Bennett. There are many people who say that the Book of Mormon sounds very Trinitarian. Also, it's interesting to note that Denver Snuffer has recanonized the lectures on faith in his group, which many also claim to be Trinitarian as well. What does Denver think about that? Does the Book of Mormon contain Nauvoo-style theology? Check out our conversation. Hey, I just wanted to mention one other thing. Beyond the Blocks is an awesome podcast, and it seeks to center the narratives of the marginalized in conversations on Mormonism. A black lifelong member and queer theologian, Brother Jones and Brother Knox, seek to fill the gaps between Mormon theology and Mormon culture that find all kinds of identities may claim a seat at the table of Christ. So check out Beyond the Block. It's a great podcast. Now back to our conversation. So you're telling me that you've recanonized lectures on faith because that was actually taken out yes. in the LDS. So you've recanonized that essentially. Yeah, it's in here. Uh, lectures on faith is section, the teachings and commandments, section 110. Um, yes, uh, hmm. recanonized it. It was actually never. See, here's two interesting factoids. First is. Lectures on faith were canonized by a vote of the church. They were not removed. They remain, by vote of the church in general conference, canonized scripture. They were deleted without a vote by a committee in 1921 that simply took the step of dropping it and saying, we're not sure it's good material we're, we're not uh, going to keep it in the scriptures. So it was decanonized. The second interesting fact is that no conference until these scriptures ever uh, accepted and canonized the Book of Mormon. The Book of Mormon was simply accepted. But it was never accepted and canonized by a vote of a conference until it was done so for these scriptures in, in one of your conferences? Yeah, it, it happened in Boise in 2017, as I recall. So let me, um, let me tell you the whole reason behind all of this effort. Because hundreds of volunteers donating thousands of hours of effort worked tirelessly for, for a long period of time to put this material together in a correct form. There was a, a revelation that was given... In um, September of 1832, church got organized in April of 1830. By the time you get to September of 1832, this is the sad news that, that the church is getting. Your minds in time past have been darkened because of unbelief and because you've treated lightly the things you've received, which vanity and unbelief have brought the whole church under condemnation. And this condemnation rests upon the children of Zion, even all. And they shall remain under this condemnation until they repent and remember the new covenant, even the Book of Mormon, and the former commandments which I have given them, not only to say, but to do according to that which I have written, that they may bring forth fruit, meet for their father's kingdom. Otherwise, there remains a scourge and a judgment to be poured out upon the children of Zion. So... Condemnation was brought, and, and the focus that most people have on those words is to do. But what became apparent is that the problem is not merely doing, it is also in the saying. Meaning that the revelations were entrusted to them, but they weren't accurately preserving or accurately saying what it was that I, and the I in that statement is God, God saying, I gave this to you, and you're not saying what I said, and you're not doing what I've required of you, and therefore you're, you're condemned. And this happens within, what, 18 months of the, uh, of the uh, founding of the church, the condemnations there? Well, if they'd taken that seriously in September of 1832, you still had available to you the original translation manuscript that we don't have. They would still have the original revelations to Joseph that we still don't have. 
or we have not been able to preserve entirely intact. And the recovery effort could have been done by the time you got to the conference in 1835 where they adopt the Doctrine and Covenants with lectures on faith and, and the others. Um, but they didn't do it. And so today, when, when you say you're under condemnation because you failed both to say and to do what the Lord had done and said and required that you do, um, if you're going to set about at this late date to try and make that right and to uh, put it all back together again, what you find is that it is, um, it's an impossible undertaking. You can get close. You can get a whole lot closer than what you do in a traditional Latter-day Saint set of scriptures or a Community of Christ set of scriptures. You can get a whole lot closer. But you really would have needed to undertake this work while Joseph Smith was alive in order to actually accomplish what brought the church under condemnation in September 1832 to emerge out from under that condemnation. But um, this effort was undertaken as the best efforts that can be made with the available source material and, um, and uh, it was a labor of love intending to show at least to the Lord that although we may not be able to get all the way there, there is a group of people still left on the earth who take seriously the condemnation and would labor as uh, hard and long as they can to try and bring it back into a restored, uh, accurate state. And um, that was the scripture project which got presented to the Lord for his approval. Um, the uh, Teachings and Commandments section 156 is a prayer that was offered to try and, um, and get the scriptures accepted and acknowledged. Uh, that section 156 then received an answer and that's section 157. All of these scriptures are now uh, being produced in um, a leather bound set with 100% with, um, um, cotton paper, uh, leather bound, gilded edging, um, finest leather, finest binding, finest printing, and uh, finest materials that we can make. Unfortunately, we had to pay in advance to get them made, so... Um, the, Did you ask Martin Harris to mortgage the farm? Uh, there were actually a couple <laughs> of people who stepped forward to help with that, um, individuals who contributed in order to get the minimum order made to satisfy the requirements. I think there, uh, it's, it's more than 2,500, but less than 3,000 copies of the, uh, of the leather-bound material uh, that's going to be put out, but they were pre-purchased. So mm. I think that um, Benchmark is going to, I think they ordered 15, cop, 15 sets oh, of wow. the three volumes. I think they'll have uh, 15 sets available for sale. But it will require, it will require another pre-order at some point in the future before there's ever a second printing. But um, they're, they're really quite nice and quite accurate. Well, it sounds interesting. Uh, when, when are these going to be available? Can the public purchase these then? No, they would have had to have ordered at the time that the order went oh, in. Oh, so you have to go to Benchmark to get them, huh? Well, there will be 15 lucky souls that are able <laughs> to get them through, through Benchmark. Um, but all, all the copies that were printed were, were paid for in advance. I think I, placed, I personally pay, placed the largest single order because I bought them for myself, my wife, all of my children, and if my children are married, for their spouse also. So I bought, um, I bought a number of copies. Wow. How, how much do they run? Well, Can I, this is what's interesting. The, the, printer that, the printer that we got for this wanted to get into the Bible publishing business because mm -hmm. the Bible is the largest selling book in the world still today. And he'd never printed a Bible. So he competed with 
um, multiple printers around the world that we got bids for. The best Bible printers are not in the United States. Hmm. The very best is in the Netherlands, Royal Youngblood. Well, we passed around a copy of the Royal Youngblood among the committee, and everyone oohed and awed. But to get them to put these together would have it would have been about five hundred dollars for this set. Okay, um, but we loved it. Just so happens that a fellow was on the committee who builds books as a living. He he restores books. He makes them handmade, but he'll take a rare book. He's restored the majority of the existing prints of the original E.B. Grandin Book of Mormon that have been restored. He did it. Um, he was on the committee. He went through and he prepared the specs for the printer who wanted to get into the Bible publishing business. And this set that I'm holding mm -hmm. is based upon the Royal Youngblood workmanship and specifications and it was done at a fraction of the cost. I think each of these books is about $34 a piece. The whole set is less than $100. Mm. And um, uh, I mean, they'll, they'll obviously all be sold out because you have to pay in advance, but I'm hoping that someday there'll be a second printing. Um, Maybe a third, who knows. I'll have to put my order into Kurt Bench then, I guess. Yeah, call Kurt. <laughs> um, I wanted to clarify that, um, All right. as, it, as it turns out, the website scripture.info, I-N-F-O, was available. All of the scriptures are available for free online at scriptures.info. You can either read them all there or... You can connect to the website, and it will read them to you in a variety of voices. You can have the scriptures read to you, all, all of these. You don't need to, to buy a leather-bound set. But they're also available exactly the same document through Amazon um, in a uh, soft-bound, not leather-bound copy, available uh, online. So th they're, they're very accessible for free online. Um, they're available from Amazon in a paperback form, um, but the leather-bound copies, uh, there was a limited print of those, and um, they're virtually all spoken for, but Benchmark will have a handful. Wow. So. Um, all right, so I've, 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 got a, I've got a bunch of questions that I want to ask. So um, since you mentioned the, uh, the Book of Mormon, translation that you've done and you said that if if you take out the punctuation then it it becomes less trinitarian yes um also you mentioned uh, and i because i've read lectures on faith and one of my understandings is lectures on faith is very trinitarian and i feel like that's kind of why the lds church uh put put that away and so, um, so I'm curious, because you've recanonized that. To me, the, lecture, the lectures on faith sounds very Trinitarian, and the Book of Mormon, as we have it, does sound very, very Trinitarian. So it's interesting to me to hear you say, well, if you take out the punctuation, I guess it would support more of a Nauvoo-style theology. Is that, is that oh, what yeah, you're yeah, saying? Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. I, uh, I think so. So, um, so how would you respond to that, I guess? Well, let me see if I can find the the language. Um, the uh, the lecture that talks about uh, who God is. Uh, see, one of my problems is that uh, I just got this on the 25th, and this is the 28th. Oh, I haven't, so haven't gotten to, I haven't yeah. gotten to, um, to uh, Lectures on Faith to look at it uh, just yet. There's a definition given of who God is there uh, in Lectures on Faith. 
and it says that there is God the Father, who is a personage of um, uh, spirit, power, glory, and then there's God the Son, and he's a personage, and then there's the Holy Ghost, and the Holy Ghost is um, the mind of the Father and the Son, and um, that is very Nauvoo-era doctrinally correct. Um, and, uh, and that that definition of God is one that he returns to. The Holy Ghost in, in the lectures on faith um, makes the, uh, the personage of God uh, two, two individuals and then in addition to the two individuals uh, the Holy Ghost is the mind of, um, of the two of them. Well, this is also in your um, Pearl of Great Price um, definition because it's in the book of Moses, but it's in Genesis chapter 4 in these. Therefore it is given to abide in you the record of heaven, the comforter, the keys of the kingdom of heaven, the truth of all things, that which quickens all things, which makes alive all things, that which knows all things, and that which has all power according to wisdom, mercy, truth, justice, and judgment. That's in um, the Book of Moses and the Pearl of Great Price, Genesis 4 in the Old Covenants. That's the definition of the Holy Ghost, the comforter that God or that Christ says he will send in the book of John to the disciples after he ascends. That comforter is the record of heaven, the comforter, the keys of the kingdom, the truth of all things, and so on, which is exactly what is the lecture on faith description of the Holy Ghost, which is the mind of the Father and the mind of the Son the record of heaven, the truth of all things, that which quickeneth all things. And so you have two personages in lectures on faith. You have a Holy Ghost that is really a manifestation of their minds. You have in the book of Moses, uh, the Joseph Smith translation of Genesis chapter 4, the Holy Ghost being the record of heaven, the truth of all things, the comforter, um, you have uh, the Holy Ghost not as a personage. You have the Holy Ghost as a, um, as a kind of vibrant force of truth that is bestowed upon mankind generally. Then we have from the Willard Richards pocketbook that uh, statement by Joseph that the Father has a... a body of flesh and bone, the Son also, but the Holy Ghost has not a, a, a body of flesh and bones, but is a spirit. Were it not so, it cannot dwell within us. Um, and uh, there's an interesting article written about how that came about. That didn't stabilize. It went through multiple iterations and multiple expanding and contracting versions of what it was that is attributed to Joseph Smith before Brigham Young finally settled the dispute and, and reduced it to what is now in the, in the um, LDS uh, Doctrine and Covenants. Um, that may or may not be a reliable definition of the Holy Ghost. Certainly what we have in Lectures on Faith that Joseph vouched for the accuracy of and what we have in the uh, Genesis chapter 4 or uh, uh, Pearl of Great Price, Moses, uh, there I think it's Moses chapter 6, um, is a kind of different definition. So um, I don't think Joseph started out Trinitarian, although when he reports what he learned from the first vision in his story 
that he wrote in 1838 is that he went home and essentially said, I learned for myself that Presbyterianism isn't true. And that was his response to his mother when she thought he looked rather haggard from what the encounter was. Never mind, I'm well enough off. I've learned for myself that Presbyterianism isn't true. And I think that was probably what Joseph got out of the first vision on the day after the first vision. Um, anyway. So you're, so you're saying that, okay. So you're saying that lectured on faith is not Trinitarian, essentially. I mean, is that? I, no, I don't think so. You don't think it is? Okay. Yeah. Right. And and so you're saying that the Book of Mormon, if you take out the punctuation as Joseph originally wrote it, is not Trinitarian either. Right. I'm saying you can repunctuate. the The Book of Mormon in the LDS version is still John Gilbert's punctuation. Mm -hmm. Today, the LDS Church is living with John Gilbert's punctuation. We're not, um, and it's easy to repunctuate and to reach a different result. I've given a talk on this, and there's mm -hmm. the uh, there's stuff out there that, that will demonstrate what I'm talking about, if you're interested, or yeah. someone listening is interested. I hope you enjoyed our conversation with Denver Snuffer. In our next conversation, we're going to talk about the two groups of people that Denver Snuffer says the Book of Mormon was written to. Is he making outreach to those groups? The purpose of the Book of Mormon was to try to um, recover two groups of people. One was a remnant in the Americas. Another was a remnant that is referred to as the Jews. If you'd like to hear the entire interview uncut, please subscribe to patreon.com slash gospel tangents. And for just $5 a month, you can hear the entire interview without any interruption. If you'd like a paperback version of our transcripts, go to amazon.com and do a search for Gospel Tangents interview. Also, if you'd like to give the money to me and not Amazon, please subscribe on my website and I'll be able to send you a transcript as soon as they are completed and click the subscribe button. You can also find our latest information on facebook.com slash gospel tangents, as well as we're on Twitter at gospel tangents. And don't forget to subscribe on Apple Podcasts. The link is at tinyurl.com slash gospeltangents, and you can subscribe there. Also, please give us a five-star review. If you want to support all of the podcasts as part of the Dialogue Podcast Network, go to lyceum.fm, that's L-Y-C-E-U-M dot F-M, and do a search for Dialogue Podcast Network or Gospel Tangents, because, you know, that's a pretty cool one, too. Thanks again for listening. Click here to subscribe, here for a transcript, and over here we've got some of our great videos. Thanks again.